No one saw it coming. The severe flooding of the eastern United States and New York City during Hurricane Sandy. However, extreme weather is becoming the norm worldwide due to climate change. For some, the impacts are temporary. For many others, permanent. And nowhere are the impacts more devastating than in Bangladesh. It's time for all of us to get ready, because here comes the flood. Hey everyone, I'm Tyler. And this is my younger brother, Alex. And together, we're the Water Brothers. We're gonna take you on an adventure around the world to explore the state of our blue planet, a planet defined by water and its ability to sustain life. So join us on our journey as we explore the world, looking at the most important water stories of our time. And together, we will learn how to better protect our most precious resource. Bangladesh is no stranger to disasters, whether natural or man-made. Alternating rainy monsoon and dry seasons, coupled with severe cyclones, were normal. Bangladeshis had largely adapted to the challenges of their climate and had even become self-sufficient in food production. Unfortunately, in the last two decades, climate change has dramatically increased the frequency and intensity of cyclones and flooding, with alarming impacts. As a low-lying coastal country, covered by rivers and with a huge population dependent on its precious farmlands, Bangladesh is especially vulnerable to the increase in severe storms and rising sea levels. When these forces combine, they drive saltwater deep inland, causing the loss of once productive fields. These impacts have set off a mass movement of millions of people from rural areas to cities and across borders to areas ill-equipped to handle this exodus. We wanted to see for ourselves just how serious climate change has become here and what people are doing to cope. So why should you care about what's happening here on the other side of the world? Well, because Bangladesh is the canary in a coal mine and a vision of what could be coming our way very soon. Bangladesh is not responsible at all for these climate change impacts. If you look at the CO2 emissions, per capita CO2 emissions from, from a Bangladeshi, and compared to an American or other European or Canadian, then you will see the huge gap between the per capita emissions. So in terms of the emissions, we are contributing very negligible, but we are the most effective one. The tragedy is that the intensity and frequency of these events are going to increase. We have our own community-based approach of facing the natural disaster. So some kind of resilience had grown over the years. But then looks like it, 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 we are crossing the threshold. In a nation with a population of nearly 160 million people, packed into an area about the size of Florida, this increase in the intensity of severe storms and floods is destabilizing the country. So you can imagine if you're trying the density of the population in this country, and we all have more than 250 rivers and tributaries running through. So there's water everywhere. But at least water and human beings had some kind of a relationship and compatibility. Now that relationship has been broken. Bangladeshis are simply no longer able to cope with this level of climate severity and unpredictability. We have to understand the loss and damage that is being caused as a result of climate. There is displacement, there's migration. People are in many ways becoming refugees in their own homeland. The combined force of water flowing through the country is so powerful that rivers such as the Ganges and Brahmaputra are constantly shifting their course. When annual monsoons arrive and water levels rise, entire riverbanks and villages can be washed away in an instant due to river erosion. Bangladesh is a delta in formation. So these rivers are not yet stable. Bangladesh doesn't have rocks or solid river as such. It's mud. And this 
fall down, break down, and river bank erosion is one of the major reasons for human displacement. On the banks of the Padma River, or Ganges, as it is known over the border in India, river erosion is a natural phenomenon, driven by large fluctuations in river levels between the wet and dry seasons. <laughs> But the critical change now is that, as temperatures rise and glacial melt in the Himalayas increases, the difference in river levels between the two seasons has also increased. The wet season is getting wetter, and the dry season is getting drier, speeding up erosion. <laughs> আমার বাড়ি আমি দুই বে ভাঙিছি নদীর থেকে পরিবর্তন ক্যামেরে নদীর এই পরিবর্তন খালি ভাঙাই দেখছি খালি এই দেখি চলে আর রিভার এরোশন নাও ডিসপ্লেসেস ওভার 100000 পিপল পার ইয়ার ইট ইজ অ্যান অ্যাস্টাউন্ডিংলি হাই নাম্বার দ্যাট ইজ অনলি এক্সপেক্টেড টু গ্রো অ্যাজ রাইজিং টেম্পারেচারস কন্টিনিউ টু ডিসরাপ দ্য সিজনাল ফ্লো অফ রিভারস দিস সিচুয়েশন ইজ মেড ওয়ার্স বাই ড্যামস বিং বিল্ট বাই নেবারিং ইন্ডিয়া অন শেয়ারড রিভারস further altering the natural movements of water and sediment. The resulting changes have also had a huge impact on fish habitat and spawning. Fish populations have dramatically dropped, making it harder for fishermen to earn a living, as we would see down the Padma River. Today we're in the Nurail district of southwestern Bangladesh to meet with a group of fishermen who have developed a unique method of fishing using river otters to drive fish into their nets. And we've come here because rivers and coastlines are the most vulnerable areas of the country to climate change. So we're really interested to see how this fishing community has been impacted and find out how they actually use the otters to catch fish. This region is the only place on earth where you can witness fishermen using specially trained river otters to drive fish into their nets. Fish that would normally be able to evade fishermen by hiding in weeds or under rocks are no match for these otters. Pretty amazing to see how they've made this uh, partnership with the otters. You know, the otters drive the fish into the nets and the fishermen keep the more valuable commercial fish and then the otters get to eat all the ones that don't have much commercial value, but it's still quite a lot of fish for them to eat. Usually they catch these fish at night, so really we're only getting a demonstration and a little picture of how much they'll actually catch when they go in the middle of the night. When we first came here, we were a little concerned about the use of wild animals to catch fish, but what they're telling us is that these otters are actually descendants from otters they've been using for over a hundred years. So they haven't been catching any wild animals for over a hundred years. We're really seeing the process of domestication right before our eyes. It's really neat. I've never seen anything like this before. Once a widespread fishing practice in this part of South Asia, few are able to maintain this way of life, and many have given up fishing and moved away from these once self-sustaining riverside communities. Although flooding is more intense in the wet season, an overall drop in river levels is occurring. With less fresh water flowing south to the ocean, the flow of water is not powerful enough to push back the force of tides. So salt water now moves further upriver. Fish populations are dropping and many fish species they used to catch cannot survive in this saltier water. So fishermen are often left with no choice but to abandon their livelihood and communities. Farmers are also struggling due to arable land being permanently lost and due to seasonal shifts in the timing and intensity of annual monsoon rains that provide the water needed to grow rice, their staple crop. At the peak of the monsoon, when you expect so 600 millimeters of rainfall in a location in a month, for 20 days you may have 100, 150 millimeters, which is very low. And then all of a sudden, in one day or two days, you have another 800 millimeters. So this peculiarity in behavior is our main worry. 
the main sector that would suffer is the agriculture sector, the crop sector. Now, Bangladesh is a very small country, 155,000 square kilometers, and we are 160 million people. But we still produce sufficient food for ourselves. Now, this great achievement in agriculture is beginning to unravel as the timing of the monsoons becomes increasingly unpredictable. In a country where half the population is employed in agriculture, changes in the pattern of monsoons weaken the entire economy. But for the tens of millions who live in the coastal regions of Bangladesh, the increasing intensity and frequency of storms and cyclones are also wreaking havoc on their ability to grow crops. Between 2007 and 10, there has been three mega cyclones. Each of them have a return period of 20 years. So this three should have happened in 60 years time and happened over a period of five years. In the last 20 years, 18 major cyclones have hit Bangladesh, displacing over 19 million people. When Cyclone Isla struck the coast in 2009, over 1 million people were left homeless and thousands were killed. What the climatologists and disaster experts say, it is very difficult to say that cyclone is caused because of this amount of you know, CO2 or greenhouse gas coming from point X or point Y or this population or that uh, you know, urban system or energy system. That is very difficult. But if you analyze that over the last 10 years, the number of major disasters has more than tripled. Now that cannot be explained in any other way. So all over the world, I mean, the, the, the signs This will there. happen all over the world. And not only is it going to be reflected in warming up, though it's called global warming, it will also reflect in cooling, extreme precipitation of snowfall. And that we are also seeing in the Northern Hemisphere quite a bit. Drought that we are seeing in United States, Central or Midwest America. Wildfires that we are seeing in California, Australia, all over the world. Floods from Indonesia, Australia, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Pakistan never had flood before. So our system is pretty loaded with many extreme events. And it is one of those misfortunes where they combine together is it is the poor of the world who will be most hard hit and least capable to resist the impact of climate change. As extreme weather events become more common, it has become increasingly difficult for communities to adapt and rebuild, especially when storm surges move salt water deep inland, inundating farmers' fields. Bangladesh being the Gangetic flat plain is extremely flat. So little rise of sea level means a lot of area will be inundated, and this is by salt water. This coastal area is the breadbasket of Bangladesh. One meter will inundate about 17% of the country's area. So this is about 20 million people would be inundated. As sea levels rise and storms become more frequent and intense, salty water is being pushed further and further inland. So one response by the government has been to invest in the growth of a national shrimp farming industry but as the entire landscape here is being transformed, some scientists and even shrimp farmers themselves are beginning to fear that this industry could be making the country even more vulnerable to climate change. Saline water has caused different kind of fishing, which was shrimp cultivation, and that impacted on the life of the communities because now the soil has been spoiled and we can't have agricultural products. You can't have, you know, you can't ensure food security. Since shrimp farming began here in the 1980s, foreign demand has skyrocketed, making the practice so profitable that some landowners have intentionally cut open protective embankments to allow salt water to penetrate and destroy healthy farmland. 
না এলাকা তো সব লবণ পানি এখানে ওই অবস্থা এখন বর্তমানে নেই ঘের শুরু থেকে ওরকম হয়েছিল হয়তো কিছু অংশ ঘের হয়েছে কিছু অংশ লবণ পানি ঢুকিয়ে ফসল মার গেছে এরকম অবস্থা হওয়ার কারণে এখন সার্বিকভাবে লবণ পানি উঠে গেছে What began as an effective way for locals to adapt to saltwater intrusion has grown into a massive industry taken over by an elite group of businessmen who are now speeding up the process of saltwater intrusion to grow the size of their shrimp farms. Singri sash melakar manusher jonno bhalo bolte byakti bishesher jonno bhalo pujibadite jonno kintu sadharon janogon er kono subidha bhog korte parchi na. বাইরের এলাকা ভিতরের ওই প্রভাবশালী লোকেরা এরা তো চাই ঘের হবে কিন্তু আমাদের মতন এরকম গরিব মানুষ আমরা তো চাই না যে ঘের হবে না টু মেক রুম ফর নিউ শ্রিম ফার্মস প্রেসিয়াস ম্যানগ্রোভ ফরেস্ট হ্যাভ অলসো বিন কাট ডাউন রিমুভিং দিস ন্যাচারাল ব্যারিয়ারস ফর স্টর্ম প্রোটেকশন দ্য সলটি সয়েল ক্যানট সাপোর্ট প্ল্যান্ট গ্রোথ উইথাউট ভেজিটেশন দ্য এক্সপোজড ক্র্যাকড আর্থ ইজ ইজিলি ওয়াশড অ্যাওয়ে ডিউরিং ফ্লাডিং This spot I'm standing in really highlights one of the major problems associated with shrimp farming. On this side, this farmer has recently flooded his field with salt water in an attempt to grow shrimp. On this side, the farmer is still wanting to grow rice. But as the salt water from this field eventually leaches into this one, this farmer will be left with only two options: to start growing shrimp himself or to sell his land and move away. Land grabbing has become widespread. and the shrimp farming that was thought to be a sustainable solution to climate change has made only a small positive impact in fact it has actually lowered overall food production for domestic use and reduced employment since shrimp farms are not as labor intensive as traditional farming methods with fewer jobs available no land and without the ability to grow their own food the only place left to go is to a nearby city in search of a job So what happens when you lose your land? For many people there really is only one choice and that's to move from the rural areas to cities like here in Dhaka in hopes of finding a job. But with all these extra people, this is leading to severe overcrowding. The city is growing by over 1000 people every single day and it's also putting a tremendous amount of pressure on the city's infrastructure. Dhaka is one of the world's newest and fastest growing mega cities, now home to over 15 million people and expected to double in size in the next 25 years. If you look at the Dhaka city or Chittagong or Khulna or other cities, cities are already full. There is no place for extra people. So they are moving to cities, they are coming to the slums, they are staying with their relatives and friends and allies. and they are creating huge problem for the cities as well you don't have the housing facilities you don't have the public facilities schooling clinics you know you can see how all these different aspects of one's life is affected many migrants who move to a city like dhaka will have no choice but to find space in one of the countless crowded slums without access to clean drinking water or adequate sanitation in many ways even children who are born to these uh, migrants they are going through trauma so it's not just the present generation but intergenerational and the future generation there is no way the bangladesh can handle this kind of migration pattern within the country many buildings are being constructed too quickly without proper engineering or adequate safety measures and without an efficient system of public transportation the streets have become clogged with an endless stream of rickshaws that create horrific traffic congestion it can take hours to drive just a few kilometers the migrants that move away from the rural areas often have very little job training or education so there are very few job options available to them Yeah, if you're lucky, you might be able to get a job driving a rickshaw, work at a textile factory, or come here to one of the countless brick factories outside of Dhaka. So right now we're going to meet with some of these workers to find out what brought them to the city and see how difficult jobs like this can be. I'm Shatkira Dibara Takerse. 
কাজ করার জন্য আছে আমাদের এলাকায় কাজ নাই বিধে আমরা কাজ করার জন্য এসেছি আগে কাজ ছিল ওই আমাদের এলাকায় তো মাছের চাষ হয় চিংড়ি চাষ হয় তো গত বছর বন্যায় ডুবে যাওয়ার পরে ওই যে ঘেরগুলো আমরা ঘের বলি ঘেরগুলো সব নষ্ট হয়ে গেছে আমাদের ঘর বাড়ি জমি জায়গার মানে বিটা বিটি আসা যা আছে সব প্লাবিত অবস্থায় ঘর বাড়ি অনেকের মানে সৎকারায় আপনার পাঁচ আশি জন নব্বই জনের মধ্যে ঘর বাড়ি সব চলে গেছে Working at a brick factory is tough, and almost everything is done by hand. It is often a job of last resort for those who have lost their land and livelihoods. Despite the difficult circumstances, they were more than happy to take some time out of their day to show us how to do their job. Push it hard. Push, slam it down hard, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> one person makes 5,000 bricks a day. It's taken us about five minutes to make one, so at this pace, um, I might be lucky to make 100 today. Oh! <laughs> It's not coming out. Oh! oh that was okay. <laughs> It's a lot harder than it looks. There we go. <laughs> it took me four times, but I got a one good looking brick. All right, only 5,000 more to go, Ty. Come on, All right, let's, let's go. do it. <laughs> The people of Bangladesh are hardworking, adaptable, and want a sustainable living. While it seems inevitable that with future sea level rise and other climate change impacts, the problems could only worsen, there are many positive examples of how the people are coming up with innovative solutions to keep land productive and prevent climate migration. I have to say, Bangladeshis are amazingly resilient. If they have the information, or if we, a little bit of intervention and support, they have bounced back. In parts of the country experiencing severe flooding, one form of adaptation has been the construction of floating gardens made of layers of water hyacinth and bamboo, and then planted with enough vegetables to feed families through disasters. This farming technique has been practiced in parts of Bangladesh for hundreds of years but is now being expanded throughout the country. In coastal regions experiencing saltwater intrusion, scientists are developing salt-tolerant strains of rice that can withstand the encroaching saltwater. Some communities once involved in shrimp farming have banded together to prevent powerful shrimp farmers from taking over their lands. While these local solutions are positive steps, of course, they cannot address the more pressing issue of reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. The most effective solution is for developed countries and emerging carbon emitters to commit to less carbon intensive methods for economic development. This will have serious impact globally. This is just not Bangladesh. When you take global calculations show that there will be about 300 million people displaced due to climate change. So we have to address the climate problem uh, quite seriously and fast. Otherwise, this will go out of hand and will become a strategic issue through migration in the near future. After traveling all across this country, there is no doubt that Bangladesh is experiencing serious changes to its climate. And these changes are contributing to a mass migration of people into urban areas. But climate change is definitely not the only factor responsible. Poverty and overpopulation are always going to be issues here. River diversions in India aren't giving Bangladesh its fair share of water. And as we saw, saline water is being allowed to move even further inland by powerful shrimp farmers. But even with all these problems, we are really happy to see how the people here have woken up to the issue of climate change and are coming up with innovative and inspiring strategies to adapt. But none of these efforts will matter unless the countries that actually contribute most to carbon emissions also wake up and make a serious commitment to reduce their carbon footprint. For now, it may seem easy to ignore the human face of climate change because it is the poorest and most marginalized people on the planet who are the first victims. But if we continue to delay action on this issue, the people of this country will certainly not be the only ones who suffer.